So we'll get started. Welcome to the Yale Law School Faculty Book Talk Series. My name is Jason Eisenman. I'm the Associate Director for Administration at the Lillian Goldman Law Library here at Yale Law School, uh, the sponsor for tonight's event. We have a very special book talk tonight featuring uh, Professor Anthony Cronman and <clears throat> his New York Times editor's choice, The Assault on American Excellence. Uh, Anthony Cronman is Sterling Professor of Law here at Yale Law School, where he's been uh, a member of the faculty for 40 years. <laughs> but he's counting. Yeah. Uh, a former dean of Yale Law School, he teaches in the area of contracts, bankruptcy, jurisprudence, social theory, and professional responsibility. He also teaches undergraduate classes in philosophy, literature, history, uh, in the Directed Studies program at Yale College. Uh, he's written a number of books. The last time he did a book talk with us was for Confessions of a Born Again Pagan, published by Yale University Press in 2016. He has a BA from Williams College and a PhD in philosophy and JD here at Yale. So join me in welcoming Professor Anthony Cronman. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Jason and I have just bonded deeply, having uh, discovered what I, I didn't know before, perhaps he didn't uh, either, that we both grew up riding a surfboard, he on the East Coast, I on the West Coast. And you, you know, uh, this, this is a, an immediate and intimate connection that only a surfer can really understand. So. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that discovery, and I'm grateful for the for the introduction. Uh, a, a liberal arts education is a costly and very precious thing. What is the good of it? What's it for? Most undergraduates, I suspect, would answer. It's for acquiring the equipment, the intellectual uh, equipment, that you need to take the next big step in life, whatever that turns out to be. Gra graduate school, professional school, a job, whatever. Um, learning uh, the disciplines, the techniques, acquiring the information that you need to get ahead in life. And that, of course, is true, importantly true, and uh, uh, a student would be um, at risk if he or she ignored it. Um, but it's not the only or perhaps even the most important good that a liberal arts education has to offer. The time uh, uh, spent in college between childhood on the one side and adulthood on the other, between the, uh, the constraints of the family home, the expectations that bind one there on the one hand, and uh, grown-up life with all of its responsibilities on the other mature, maturing relationships, uh, developing a career, a mortgage, uh, all of the paraphernalia of adulthood. The college uh, years sit in between these two epochs in a person's life. And they are, in certain respects, the freest years that one has. Um, they constitute a rare in-between in life. No longer a child and not yet an adult. A time for exploration, for questioning, for self-questioning with an unparalleled in many lives, in most lives perhaps, never to be repeated degree of freedom. So what's the good of this freedom? What's 
the way to use it or spend it, the best way to use it or spend it. There are lots of good answers to that question, but I want to begin by identifying three values that I think are or ought to be served by this remarkable in-between period of freedom mm -hmm. in a person's life. And that will bring me around to some observations about why I think these values are under threat today. And then I will conclude with some general observations about the relationship between higher education and our democratic uh, way of, of life. So I would identify three goods, intellectual goods, spiritual, moral goods. I, I think they really um, uh, fit all three descriptions. And I'll just mention them briefly in order. One is the good of making some progress in figuring out what you, and by you I mean I have in mind the now my imaginary uh, idealized undergraduate, figuring out what you think and feel and believe about life, about the world, uh, about yourself. We all have um, entanglements, involvements, identities of many different sorts. Each of us is a, is a bundle of identities. And of course, uh, the beginning undergraduate brings this with him or her when they arrive on, on campus. The freedom of college life is an occasion and opportunity to put those inherited loyalties, attachments, identities under uh, a light. Uh, and to examine them with some measure of independence, never complete, to be sure, some measure of independence, and ask oneself, well, is that what I really think? Is that what I really believe, rather than just mm -hmm. kind of going along with the flow of my entanglements, asking whether I wish to affirm them? Is that really me? The first of the three goods of undergraduate life, in my idealized picture of it, is its encouragement and nurturance of the search for one's own individual self, mind, spirit. My great hero here, I'll mention a few historical figures, writers who have had a particularly deep impression on me in framing my own sense of what's important in higher education. My hero here is John Stuart Mill. I, I don't think his statement of the value of independent-mindedness, of thinking things out for oneself, his statement of it in his essay on liberty has ever been surpassed. That, for me, is a text of great importance. Second fact, uh, making some modest advance in acquiring a, a greater, firmer, rational understanding of and control over one's feelings, passions, appetites. We all have feelings and passions. We're never without them. Uh, life would be miserable without them. <laughs> what would a passionless life be? Um, be like. It's inconceivable, and if you can conceive it, it's not very attractive. At least I don't find it, find it so. But, but, but our passions can lead us around by the nose. They often do. And uh, gaining some measure of awareness, self-understanding, and self-control over our passionate lives, over our feelings, that's another great goods that a liberal arts education has to offer. My heroes here are first, uh, perhaps most importantly, Socrates, who was constantly dragooning uh, his often bewildered and sometimes unwilling Athenian uh, fellow citizens in into conversations about this or that. And they would always begin by asserting strongly that they 
knew something to be true. They, they just believed it. They were absolutely certain. It meant the world to them to think this way. And Socrates would try to coax them into a more rational view of things. Painful process, but the heart of enlightenment as he understood. Second hero uh, of mine here, Sigmund Freud. Um, some people think of Freud uh, in a badly charactered way as the, as the apostle of darkness, the, the thinker who reminded us more powerfully than any other that all of our attempts at living rationally are doomed because we are always uh, stuck in the Augean stable of our own mire, uh, of, our, of our passionate lives, which can hobble and cripple us from the, the start. Freud was actually the greatest rationalist the West has ever known. His whole endeavor was to carry the light of reason down into the Minotaur's cave and to see how far it would extend and how much of our passionate life would be lit up and made accessible uh, to us, intelligible to us. Third, and uh, most controversially, I, I suppose, um, acquiring a taste for an appreciation of excellence in works, uh, in ideas, uh, and in human lives. Um, acquiring a deepening sense that some works, uh, ideas, lives, stand higher on the register of accomplishment, of fulfillment, of energy, of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of exuberant uh, achievement. And, um, and, and with that, acquiring a sense of the utter importance of living a life of one's own that aspires to something more than the common and the mediocre, but aims high at excellence and achievement beyond the ordinary. Um, I say that's controversial um, only because while we, we all accept the idea Without, without blinking, the idea of excellence as a way of describing achievement in limited activities or disciplines. No one has any trouble acknowledging that there are excellent mathematicians or students of, of, uh, of ancient Greek uh, grammar or of plant physiology or a million other things. When one starts talking about excellence in the comprehensive work of living, of being human, and suggests that there are marks or uh, 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 of distinction, grades of achievement in that all-encompassing business, people begin to get a little nervous. But I actually think uh, one of, if not the very most important thing that an undergraduate education has to offer the lucky young people who are the beneficiaries of it is a taste, some taste, for the thought that, in fact, human lives come in grades of splendor. And one should aim at living as splendidly and bright and energetically as one possibly can. So there are three values. Um, uh, and maybe you agree with what I've said. Maybe you agree with part of what I've said. What I want to do now is quickly uh, suggest some ways in which each of these three is under assault. That's the title of my book, Under Assault in Our uh, Colleges and Universities Today. All um, of the troubles that I am about to describe could be summed up in a sentence by saying that they are the result of the politicization of campus life of the intrusion into the academy of political forces and political values, which do not have a, a proper place. First, the spirit of independent-mindedness, which I associated with John Stuart Mill, under pressure from 
uh, an increasingly intense, uh, at, at times almost tyrannical culture of groupthink, of identity politics. That's a phrase that covers a lot of ground, that it can be as misleading as informative. I'm hesitant to use it, but you all know what I mean. We don't have much time. So for convenience sake, I'll just let that stand. The idea that first and most importantly, you're a member of a group uh, to whom you owe your principal allegiance. So sure, think for yourself, but only after you've done your duty to the group to which you belong. Stand up for it, protect it, uh, uh, affirm your affinity. That is an idea which runs against the grain of the million ent enterprise of independent mindedness, uh, of becoming your own person for better and the worst. Um, second, the remarkable valorization of feeling at the expense of thinking that is epidemic in our uh, colleges and universities today. The, the, uh, the worry which uh, the faculty and administrators, as well as students, seem to share that the least uh, offense to feeling, the smallest wound, is, uh, is, uh, is an earthquake and cause for uh, uh, revisions of policy and the adoption of conciliatory gestures and a whole lot of clouding nonsense which put feeling in the driver's seat at the expense of mind or <coughs> In intelligence. That's infantilizing. It drives us all back into the cave of appetite and feeling from which Socrates and Freud uh, attempted, along with many, many others, to gently extricate us. It's retrograde. It's bad. It's an offense to the spirit of liberal learning. Third, the idea that there are excellent lives, some more excellent than others, some bright and shining lives which stand out, some beautiful lives which stand out by the contrast with what is ordinary and plain, as beauty and excellence always do. That uh, excellence uh, is, as uh, Spinoza says in the very last sentence of the ethics, difficult and rare. That idea, which I cherish and regard as uh, an essential uh, premise of the, uh, of the aims of liberal learning, that idea is by its very nature anti-democratic. And in our current environment, any suggestion uh, of, a, uh, of, of, a, of an order of values that runs against the democratic norm, the democratic muthos, the, the, the democratic conventions of our age is bound to raise hackles and uh, cause uh, those who believe in it to shut their mouths and look for uh, sh shelter. Um, we live in a democracy. It is a great and glorious fractious, uh, at times almost fractured uh, enterprise. One wonders, I wonder sometimes, how it, we keep it going year after year, decade after decade. It's a beautiful thing to behold. It rests upon the premise that we are all equal and equally entitled to the prerogatives of citizenship. We each get one vote. We are all equal in theory, at least, hopefully in practice, too. Equal before the bar of justice, and so on and so forth. And that is as it should be. But if our American democracy, with its tendency to promote uh, group think, what Tocqueville called the tyranny of majority, majority opinion, to level down what is fine and excellent and uh, rare with, with its, with its uh, distinctive pathologies of fearfulness and ordinariness which lay the uh, seedbed for tyranny and despotism, as Tocqueville warned. If that complicated enterprise is to 
is to uh, manage fitfully to get from one decade to the next. It needs an educated leadership class of men and women whose souls are large, whose minds are independent, uh, who are rational, mature individuals with a superior capacity for reflection and judgment, who can take a long view when the tides are running strong, who have a, an, an ensemble of qualities of temperament and intellect, which used to fly under the flag of virtue. That's not a word one hears much any, anymore. But I'll use it without shame or embarrassment. America needs a virtuous leadership class. If it's democracy, God bless it, God save it. If it's democracy, is to endure and not run into the hands of a despot or a tyrant who feeds off of the small-mindedness <laughs> and, uh, and herd mentality uh, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the people at large. Uh, so uh, the values I have identified that in my mind lie at the heart of a liberal learning, of a liberal education, those are in jeopardy today as a consequence of the forces I've described. That's terrible for higher education, but it's terrible for our country too, because our colleges and universities must produce, we must con be able to continue to rely upon their producing men and women of the character that I just described. So the assault on excellence in our colleges and universities is, in the end, an assault on American democracy, too. If I thought it were just our school, the, our, the precious, small, uh, well-insulated, well-guarded realm uh, of uh, higher education that was in danger, I would be disturbed because that's where I have made my life, and I care about it deeply. But uh, there are bigger issues about which we should all be concerned, and the biggest of them is the health of our democracy, about which there is a lot of talk these days for uh, reasons that I don't need to elaborate, and many different concerns of different sorts from different directions. But in my book, I've tried to raise one that is of particular importance uh, to me. Okay, that, I'm sorry for going on, as I've honestly planned to do that in about half the time, but uh, I've never been able to do anything in half the time I thought I could. So uh, let me just uh, stop there and uh, take anything short of objects with sharp edges. <laughs>